are the first. The first to see the gods. The first to tame their beasts. The first to guard the soul from evil. We conquered this land and built an empire. The Origins team is made up of key members of the crew that brought Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag to life, and when they set out to make this grand adventure, they knew they needed a setting to match their ambitions. You know what we say history is our playground? Ancient Egypt is a, you know, it's a romantic setting, it's a mystical setting. There's a lot of diversity in the landscape of Egypt, and that's why it's fascinating, and that's why it was also amazing and uh, super inspiring for the team to recreate. Obviously, the first thing that comes to mind is pyramids. We we're going to have that into the game. Uh, that's, it's a no-brainer. But ancient Egypt is much more than, than ancient pyramids. So history is like, a, is like a, a puzzle, right? My job and the way the, work, the team works is really to find out all, all these small details with this information. So what are the flowers, the trees that were back in Egypt? What were the animals? We try to respect both the culture, the Egyptian culture, and to putting them into the game, uh, and also having something that's, that's interesting. How I actually saw ancient Egypt, first of all, in my imagination. I mean, you, you only see like, you know, sands and sort of, you know, pyramids, and it's really kind of dry. But actually, you know, during that time, it was lush, and you know, it was full of life. We have now the capacity from a technological standpoint to be able to create a, a massive countryside. You know, it's not a, it's not a city, it's, it's a whole country with many cities, many villages, many exotic uh, landscapes. This is why we decided to remove the minima, which is we want you to enjoy and to actually experience the beautiful world we're bringing to you. You will have to play the game to put some icons in the game, you know. Also the fact that we have a time of day that is systemic, we made sure that every single moment in the time of day is almost like a painting, you know. That's not something that is done, like, it's not automatic, it's really crafted. The world is, I think, has never been so alive and so lush and so interesting. And I hope players will, will have a lot of hours of fun uh, into Egypt with us. We started by saying we're in Egypt, which meant large landscapes, which meant vehicles like animals, like uh, chariots, camels. All of this, we felt we needed to make sure that all of this worked within the combat system. So naturally, we start talking about ranged combat, using the bow, using uh, throwable weapons. We allow the fight to be way more responsive, way more dynamic, so that the player can really play the way they want. In previous ACs, when you attack, the hero and the enemy came together, no matter the distance, effectively. This is gone now. Now, all of a sudden, your spacing in the fight, how many enemies you're fighting, where are they, matters. If you swing in open air, you can. And you could screw yourself over by doing that. In melee combat, we have a lot of different types of weapons. We've got maces, swords, axes, uh, shields. You know, the reach of your weapon matters. The stats of your weapon matter. So you have to really judge your position in the fight, mixed in with the length of your weapon, the speed of your weapon, the positions of the enemies. And in range combat, we have different types of bows. So we have uh, the most famous one is probably the Predator bow, which is a, the equivalent of a sniping rifle. We got a bow that has a super high rate of fire. And we have a, a bow that is the equivalent of a shotgun that shoots five arrows at the same time. We have many types of enemies with their own weapon loadout. Their weapon loadout dictates the way they fight. So players will have to learn how does the enemy with the spear and the shield work versus uh, the guy with the huge mace. And reading their behavior in the fight then asking themselves, what am I comfortable using against these types of enemies in this situation? So it's a, it's a much different system than we've had in the past, but it's afforded us uh, really brand new experiences for players that I'm excited for people to try and play and, and give us feedback on it. Really, you, you cater your play style to what you like based on how you level up in the skill trees. And that's something we want to also visualize and show on the player. So it's not only something that we play in the stats, but it's also something you will see on the character. We give players many avenues within the crafting system, within the inventory system, uh, within the skills. So uh, a concrete output of this means that you cannot assassinate anybody in the game with one shot. 
if you dedicate yourself to crafting your hidden blade, to increasing the, the damage that it can do, you might be able to get there. But you have to dedicate yourself to it. Now going more action RPG forced us to say, no, no, you have to deal with the challenges of the game, the levels of the enemies, and um, you can be that super stealthy assassin, but dedicate yourself to it. Now because we have levels, we have uh, RPG mechanics, it has afforded us to be able to do epic bosses. So in, in the main story of the game, but also in the, in the world where we know some players, if they're really comfortable with the challenge of the fight, they can go and push themselves to, to fight the most ultimate bosses. It's a very big world also, so to make sure that the player would be constantly engaged within that world, um, we created um, NPCs that have their own agenda. They have their own purpose in the world, so they, they work, they go back to their home to sleep, and you can help them with the quest system. So you meet them, you talk with them, and they say, I need some help with this. And as a player, you get to make a decision whether or not you want to engage with that specific type of, a, of NPC. So I think that's interesting, and that also gives flexibility to explore the world the way you want to and live the story the way you want to as a player. The player, of course, picks up these quests and chooses what they want to work on. Sometimes the quests will intermingle. Sometimes you're in the middle of one quest and you'll see a que another quest uh, person walking by and you can jump into that. And we wanted this very organic feel to the world. There's a lot of people to meet, a lot of characters, and they have a lot of stories to tell. It's not only an origin story, it's also witnessing key moments of the franchise and the reasons why decisions were made. Was it just someone decided, I'm going to put on a hood? No, no, there, there's stories behind all of this and these are the experiences that you explore in the game. Uh, so for sure, Eagle Vision is, is one more of those elements where, why is it called Eagle Vision and where did it really come from? Bayek has also uh, this connection, this very special connection with, uh, with the Eagle Senu that you can use, you know, to really scout and, and plan ahead, you know. So with your eagle, you'll be able to spot, you know, who's, uh, what the challenge is about, you know, seeing the level, the number of enemies. In this exact setting was also the perfect moment and the perfect, actually, world and culture and mythology to, to see, to witness the, the birth of the, of the brotherhood. I mean, it's, it's so much fun, man. It's so great. Like, it's so, so cool and it's an honor, you know. Uh, but telling an origin story, you get to put some pieces of the puzzles together and explain a little bit more to the player. Uh, so that's really cool. The demo we have, it's called the Fayum region. Mm -hmm. It's about halfway through the, the main story, the main quest line. Uh, the reason we chose this area, because we wanted, we knew by, by saying Egypt, the first thing people might think about the world is, is deserts. There's a lot of deserts. Oh, yeah. And there are, but the world is super lush, super exotic. There's a lot of, uh, there's a huge variety of landscapes. Uh, so we wanted to show off that Egypt is very diverse. And it, you know, it was halfway through the story, so there's not too much spoilers in there as well. Mm -hmm. That's why we chose this area. Sounds like a good spot. And we got a look at it earlier today, and yeah, it just opens up, and there's this big lake, and it's ringed by mountains, and uh, you get a lay of the land real easily with uh, your new friend. You've got yes. a literal eagle vision yes. to help you out. That's Senu? Senu, yes. Senu is very useful. Um, so for sure, by having a bird's eye view of a location, uh, we're able to tag enemies, tag opportunities, uh, scout the land from a literal bird's eye view. Mm -hmm. um, of course, everything can be done without Senu, but it's less efficient, obviously. What we wanted to show off is uh, the world, the AI, uh, is living in this world. Mm -hmm. So from fishermen on their felucas, going fishing, taking their goods back to the ports, uh, to military patrolling on smaller boats, but also giant triremes. Mm -hmm. uh, and these areas, uh, uh, hold a lot of opportunity for players, so of course finding military weapons, finding crafting uh, materials, uh, but also quests take place there. The game launches on October 27th on PS4, PS4 Pro, Xbox, PC, and of course it's a launch title for Xbox uh, One X. We, we still have a bit of time, we're still finishing this game, we have a bit of work to do, 
but uh, but it's almost there. The experience is really coming together. You know, when we started by saying let's do ancient Egypt, it was going to be a country. Ancient Egypt meant many things for us. It meant yes cities but also all the wilderness areas and we wanted to show the diversity of this wilderness and and something that people as they play the game and get into hours and hours of it they're constantly seeing new stuff from the world from the environment the team began with a world around the size of assassin's creed 4 black flags with one important difference it's all land well it's mostly land no matter where you are there's a density to the landscape that creates a feeling that there's always some area you haven't explored something you haven't uncovered in terms of the, the granularity of the details, the, the experiences that you can have, the things you can run into, the NPCs, the animals, the fauna, uh, it was, it's much, much more dense. Uh, so this is definitely, in terms of content, the biggest world we've, we've ever built. We wanted that the exploration of the world to really be jaw-dropping. We wanted people to be lost in this world for hours and hours, so the game is quite huge. The world is massive. Egypt, even in the game setting of 49 BCE, was never an undifferentiated landscape of deserts, pyramids, and snazzy headgear. It was huge and cosmopolitan, a hub of trade, agriculture, and craftsmanship. From Alexandria to Memphis, Egypt was a place of geographical contrast and cultural diversity, and recreating the entire country as a single open world is one of Assassin's Creed Origins' greatest achievements. So if you go into Alexandria, it's a very Greek city, a very big and broad streets. And then you go into Memphis, it's very crowded. And all of this is based on the historical research that we do. So we learned, for instance, that the, the Memphis is very close to the Nile and that the course of the Nile changed with centuries and that it affected the, how the city was built. And so in return, that affects the way that we create that city and that, that is what players will experience. A city filled with, with water, with caves, with... Uh, uh, surrounded by the Nile with boats around, so uh, very, very nice and rich city. So historical research is very important for us. Next to capturing the scale and detail of Egypt, the game's biggest task is to fill its vast spaces with interesting things to see and do. The Egypt of Assassin's Creed Origins is a dynamic place, one where you'll always be able to find wildlife to hunt, a secret to uncover, a bandit gang to raid, or a quest to pursue. In fact, you'll need to discover the game's quests on your own, and there are multiple ways to do it. A vital contact might direct you to someone who wants you to check on a friend in danger, for example, or you might just stumble onto that friend while exploring and get pulled into a new adventure. You can even leave a quest at any time, pursue other tasks, and then pick up again from where you left off. There's tombs and temples to explore, there's puzzles in the world, you know, left by the ancient people. There's a lot of uh, really cool activities to do in the world. There's a huge density there. Assassin's Creed Origins is set during the reign of Cleopatra, an extremely tumultuous and pivotal era for Egypt, and one that fits in well with the series' preference for periods of conflict, upheaval, and massive societal change. The, the game takes place during her ascension to the throne. Um, during this time period, uh, her father, Ptolemy XII, had passed away, and so he left the country into the hands of Cleopatra and her brother, Ptolemy XIII, uh, who is the boy king. And uh, right away there was conflict and strife and, and a civil war between the two and Cleopatra gets exiled. And so we catch up to her uh, in our context when she's exiled and so she's on her way to reclaiming her throne. Pretty much everyone in uh, Cleopatra's uh, family has been, has been assassinating each other. Uh, so that creates this unique set that's tremendous to create a story and to go around all of this, this plot. Ptolemy 13 appears to have the full support of a masked secret society, calling itself the Order of the Ancients. And since history tells us the Boy King's power grab was orchestrated mostly by his advisors, it's likely the masked men are behind the Civil War itself. The Order of the Ancients are trying to control Ptolemy XIII. They believe that he's younger and weak and that they could manipulate him easily. However, they're, they're a secret society uh, and they will always be in Bayek's path. And so you will have to make your way through that. In any case, Cleopatra would soon have a powerful ally of her own. And at this point, uh, we have Caesar who shows up at some point chasing after another Roman, uh, Pompey. Pompey came to Egypt in order to be protected, thinking that they had an alliance. But Ptolemy, knowing that Caesar was coming, he decides to assassinate Pompey as a gift to Caesar, which only uh, uh, infuriates Caesar, saying that he was, yes, he was my enemy, but he was also a Roman. You cannot kill a Roman like that. And so this pushes him to ally with Cleopatra. 
And so we get to meet these key central figures. So Caesar being, you know, this legendary tactician, uh, one, I think one of the most epic historical figures that we can possibly have uh, in the Assassin's Creed series. We wanted our players to experience it sort of as if, you know, for Bayek, these are also at some point uh, gods, you know, Cleopatra, Ptolemy, they, they're considered to be gods in this world. And as he meets them and he's almost, you know, begin at, in awe of who they are, as soon as he meets them and he realizes these are human beings with their own flaws and weaknesses and strengths, and he connects with some, doesn't connect with others, and this is, we, we want it to be a reflection of how, you know, hopefully our players can also envision these kind of people. Have them boiled to death inside a bronze bull. Goddess, no. They were cohost. Bayek's quest isn't just about exploring ancient Egypt or defying the Ptolemies, or even fighting the masked agents of the Order of the Ancients. It's about finding a new place in a world whose changing traditions have made him obsolete, and it's a quest that will lead, eventually, to the founding of what we now know as the Assassin Brotherhood. From the start, we know that assassins are fictive characters, so it's all right. I mean, we acknowledge that this is not a documentary, even if we're based off history, even if history is our playground and we like to play with it. So Bayek, uh, within that environment, even though he's fictive and he interacts with real people, we try to make it believable. That really uh, rootens him into the realm of Egypt. In the vast open world of Assassin's Creed Origins, the new combat system creates a lot of new ways to deal with your enemies. Making a ruckus can be very effective, but stealth has always been a favorite tool of the Assassins. So we talked to the developers about how you can take a sneakier approach to getting what you want. You know, stealth is part of the lifeblood of this series. What are some of the ways that players can really lean into that stealthy play style in Origins? So with the abilities, you can really start extending what you can do in stealth. You know, sometimes you might see a group of four guards having the ability to forward time. This will actually, you know, th those guards will get up and they'll do their daily business. At some point, maybe they'll go to sleep. The point is, this is an ability that allows you to change the setup. The stealth system itself is very different than previous ACs. Now it's really distance-based. That's an important thing because we wanted the player to be able to cat and mouse with the AI. So you don't get detected right away. They might see you, they might see a threat, but they might re not recognize the true threat that it is. So they need to come closer, they need to investigate. This allows you to start splitting groups up. Combined with, with sleep darts, with poison, uh, you can really manipulate the environment. From the level design, uh, already you can uh, really sneak into a lot of locations, you know. Uh, you, you can sneak into uh, forts, into camps that you are really, really, you know, uh, under a level. If you're, if you're detected, you'll be dead, but nothing is preventing you from uh, trying it and using the level design. We've worked very hard on the level design to make sure that there's constant opportunities to be able to stay in a stalking zone, to go up high. You know, being a predator in AC, that means you go up high. Or you can actually gain other abilities, so like sleep knives, poison, uh, taming animals. What happens once you tame an animal? Does it just kind of like come alongside with you and like bite anyone's face off? Exactly. Messes with you? <laughs> exactly. First, you need to be able to, to, to tame them, right? To tame it. So it's not just out of nowhere, you know, you're able to tame animals. You first need to put them asleep so that you can approach them without any risk and then tame them. You know, if you consider the bow as part of your stealth equipment, that's another way you can upgrade the damage of the bows, you can upgrade what they can do themselves. One of the skills that I was really enjoying during my playtime is the predator bow. Mm -hmm. Steering that arrow just gives it that extra little oomph, doesn't it? Yes, when you manage to master the bow, the arrow, it's awesome. The feeling of actually continuing to chase your target <laughs> using your arrow, is, is, is an awesome feeling, but it's quite hard. So uh, some might not like it, which is fine because we have uh, many other opportunities. I think one of my favorite ways to play stealthy is to create those distractions. You know, you set yep. a fire over here, Absolutely. everyone gets a little alarmed and like, oh, I'm just gonna go accomplish my objective over here. Oh, and I, I would even say a lot of people don't realize it, but you have a torch that you can take out. So you can toss it to create a distraction. So that's another tool, stealth tool that you have. I was also excited to see that there's a skill that allows Senu to sort of get into combat a little bit with you. Yes, absolutely. This is something that uh, we thought that was really cool actually and, and makes sense. So when you're, you know, uh, approaching a camp and you want to distract some, you know, to, uh, to sneak on the other side, 
will just use Senu on, on, uh, on one guard, she will take uh, care of it. I would love that players who want to play stealth get to explore the system and find you know, really cool moments that we didn't think of ourselves. Uh, and I think there are many of those. I am a Magi, protector of Egypt. My land is on the brink of collapse. My name is Abu Bakr Salim, and I play Bayek of Siwa in Assassin's Creed Origins. Just to go back a bit to talking about how this came about, you know, you've, you've worked on television shows like 24 and Black Mirror and recently Strike. Have you worked in animation or video games before? You know, how did you get the part? I've never worked in animation or video games ever before. This is my first game. And uh, yeah, I actually, auditioning for this, it was advertised as an animated TV series, which needed motion capture. And, um, you know, different characters, you know, different time frame, different, you know, it was, it was, very, it was very different. And um, did the first round, it was great. Then got to the second round, and that's when they dropped the bomb that it was Assassin's Creed. And yes, I died a little inside but it was, it was a beautiful death. Came back to life and did the best I could. <laughs> and yeah, so then, uh, but yeah, it was, um, it, was a, it was an interesting process because it was very different to normal other auditions. Um, you know, the camera was positioned in a way in which it captured the whole room. So they needed to see your body and see how, you, how you'd move and how you'd, you know, how the character would move. And you know, I had the animation director there as well as a, a cinematography director there. And um, yeah, they direct me differently and depending on, you know, what they wanted to try and bring out of the character. And yeah, so it was, it was really exciting. It was an interesting way of auditioning. So how was the process of, of doing it? You talked there about seeing how the character would move and how the character yeah. would, would fit in the space. Obviously in the past it used to just be voice recording, whereas now you've got the motion capture, you've got a camera on your face. How hard does that make it? You know, do you have to be very aware of how you're moving and how you're expressing things as you speak? I mean, I guess, uh, well, I mean, like with acting, anyway, you kind of have you, you don't re, you're, you're thinking a bit about how you are moving and how you're speaking and different, you know. But at the but at the end of the day, you're still you you know you've got this kind of objective and you've got to try and you you you've got to follow that through. So you're not really thinking much about it. What was what was interesting though was because we had the animation director in the room, you know, certain things like you know either touching someone or hugging someone. Um, you had to do, you know, in a specific way because otherwise the animators would have uh, difficulty, you know, e editing that. And it's and it is there. You have to kind of you do have to think of okay, I'm not necessarily going to stab you. I'm going to stab the air. You have to react, and then you know that's the way kind of the, the way movement sort of worked in the in those in those uh, in those rooms. It wasn't necessarily as clear as doing small movements. You still had to do big movements so it could be captured. But also you didn't want to do two grand movements, otherwise it would look ridiculous. So, yeah. So how long did the process take? Oh man, I'm still, like, it's, like, ages. <laughs> I've been working on it for now nearly a year. So, um, yeah, so it's, because it is, because there is so much content and there's so much to, um, to record and, you know, constantly, you know, new things are being added into the game. It, the, the process never stops. So yeah, so state is now. I've, I think I've nearly been. I've been working on it for now, nine, nine, ten months. So yeah, back and forth from Montreal doing the motion capture and and VO stuff, which has been. I mean, it's, it's been great fun all the time. But like, it's it, yeah, it's been a very long process. Very different to film and TV, where it's like after three months or four months on TV, that's it. You know, then you do the ADR, then you wait for it to come out. No, I think with the video, with this anyway, the, it's constantly evolving and constantly adapting, which is great. You mentioned earlier that you'd uh, played some of the previous Assassin's Creed games, and obviously people have got their favorite assassins, but they've all kind of gone on quite a journey through the stories, like Altair going from like a reckless character to being sort of more thoughtful, like an old man mm. looking for meaning and, and answers, and Ezio going from like being sort of a... Yeah, like a kind playboy, of, yeah. yeah to, <laughs> to being like this big leader of men. Does, does Bayek go on a similar journey? I think Bayek's journey is really, it, it's, it's, it's very internal. I think that's what's so interesting about this this game, anyway, is that his journey is, you know, it, it is again the origin the origins of the Brotherhood, but there is a there is a journey, and from what I've done and from what I've read, it, it's it's not as as big as Etsy. He doesn't make as as big of a change as Ezio, or you know, or even like Connor. It's very, it's a it's a personal journey, and I think that's what's 
quite exciting about this game is that you know they've got a completely different way of you know portraying these characters, portraying the world. You know, Ubisoft have taken you know taken risks and beautiful risks, and it's yeah, it's going to be great to see the, the finished product. So obviously, nobody knows how people in 49 BC spoke in terms of like accents and uh, dialects and stuff. How did you and the team settle on how Bayek should speak? Oh well, we had um, <laughs> so that's a good question. It was a, it was very much a creative process. So you know we had a dialect coach in there. We, we again we've got no you know we had a historian there. But what was what was great was because there was nothing that we could go back to to look at. It gave us a lot of room to play and create. So we ended up you know we we tried especially with dialect to try and get you know Egyptian words in there as much as we could um, to kind of keep in with that immersion. Uh, you know, when it came to even deciding on accents, we worked a lot with, with an accent coach and, um, you know, coming to certain decisions on saying certain things. So, for example, um, you know, Bayek doesn't roll his R's, whereas some Nubians might roll their R's, or even, no, even the Greeks would roll their R's. So these sort of rules were kind of set in stone, and then we'd kind of, you know, we would be creating this, this accent, this world within it as we went on, which was great fun to do, really great fun to do. So, yeah. When, when you were doing the motion capture, were you working with the other actors in the game, like um, like Aya, the, the woman who plays Aya? And, uh... Yeah, so um, yeah, Aya's played by Alex Wilton Regan, and she is a force to be reckoned with. Incredible, incredible woman. Yeah, so I, you know, a lot of my scenes took place with her. Um, it also took place with uh, Zora Bishop, who plays Cleopatra. And um, yeah, it was it was great fun working with them and working with all the other actors as well on the mocap floor. Um, because again, there was someone to play off. I mean, normally, you know, I'm sure voiceovers, normally you're in a booth and you record and the other person's recorded the dialogue before, so you don't really have that connection. Whereas on the actual floor, you've got this, you know, you've got this space to create and play. And it's, it's so much fun, so much fun. And I mean, Alex, I mean, I was a fan of Alex before, you know, before I even, you know, started playing Assassin's Creed, you know, she's, she's done so many video games. So it was pretty crazy to think, oh my God, she's playing my wife. <laughs> like, it's insane, but. But yeah, it must be pretty tough to do anything romantic scene-wise with the big camera. Oh, stuff it's so much fun! It's so much fun with the, with the camera there doing kissing, and I mean, I don't know how the facial animators are coping with seeing my kissing face. I mean, I'm sure they're having a lot of fun and laughing at me behind my back about it. But no, I mean, yeah, it is quite hard to do intimate scenes, especially with the Velcro as well moving. If you hug someone, you might get stuck to them, and you have to kind of pull yourself off. So you've got to be aware of all these different things. But um, but again, it's all part of the joy of, of, of making a video game. It's all part of that, that fun process of, of being silly. You know, it, it is, it's like, it's, it is, it, that's, that's what it is. It's just playing. Do you feel that you'd like to continue doing stuff with video games and voice work? Oh man, yeah, yeah. I mean, it is, it's, it's, such, a, it's such an interesting way of telling a story. It's, it's so, you know, this, this way of interactively, you know, communicating these journeys that, you know, these people are going through. It's, it's, so, it's so powerful that it's, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to be, continue being a part of that. Because it's, it's so different to film and TV, you know, you're giving an hour or so or two, or even sometimes if it's a series, eight, 12 hours to, you know, to the viewer. Whereas with games, you're giving hundreds of hours and you're going, and you know, there is these worlds in which they're exploring and creating, you know, that they're, that they're, you know, they're viewing and experiencing and it's, yeah, it's, it's so rich. It's such a rich way of storytelling. People are actually playing you rather than them watching you. So they're, they're going watching, to get really attached. exactly. Yeah, they are, they are, they are you know, participating in that, you know, in, that, in that journey that the character is going through. They're going to connect to certain things, react to certain things, you know, with this character. And it's, it is, it's, it's a beautiful, yes, yeah, a beautiful experience. Are you the kind of actor who, who can't watch stuff that they're in? Or are you going to actually play, <laughs> play this game? Oh man, I'm going to, I'm, as, like, as I've said, I'm going to be out there queuing up, you know, the day before, waiting for that launch and playing that game to death. I'm not going to lock myself in a room and play it. It's, yeah, I cannot wait, cannot wait. I mean, I'm sure I'm going to cringe at some moments and think, oh, why did I say it that way? But at the same time, I'm so excited for it, yeah. Magi no longer. We shall be known as assassins. <laughs>